Hello everyone, I'm Parsa Mufti and I welcome you to a panel discussion on COVID-19. Has India failed? India has crossed 25.3 lakh COVID cases and now has the third highest cases in the world. Even though India's population is four times bigger than the US, the tech tests conducted per million people in India are roughly half of the tests in the US. Experts have argued that the lockdown has failed in stopping community transmission and that India will soon have the highest number of COVID cases. Others have also argued that the Atmanirbhar and PM Garib Kalyan packages do not address the real problem and are only window dressing. There are also serious questions about India's health infrastructure that have gone before due to the pandemic. Given this, I am privileged to host Dr. Ritu Priya, Public Health Specialist and Professor at JNU, and Abhay Shukla ji, eminent activist with the Jan Swastha Abhiyan. Thank you for sparing time today for this important discussion. My first question will be to Dr. Ritu Priya, who is the editor of an important volume on health. Public health expenditure as a proportion of the GDP is just 1.3%, one of the lowest in the world. Consequently, high out-of-pocket expenditure by ordinary Indians pushes 63 million Indians into poverty every year. How bad is COVID going to impact India? Well, uh, there are two parts to your question, I think. One, how bad is COVID going to be as the health impact of the pandemic? And there, I think we need to put things in perspective. We have now almost 50,000 deaths, and I think that's 50,000 deaths too many. right? But at the same time, if we look at it in perspective of the larger health picture, then that is, even in this peak period, about 4% of deaths daily that happen in the country. And if we take it that there will be, you know, we have 50,000 now and it will be about a lakh at the end of the year, that's going to be about 1% of the total deaths that happen in the country, 1.2% in fact. So what about the other 98 or 99% of illness that needs health care just as much as COVID does? Since it is a peak period, COVID is going to take its toll and it already has. We're seeing all the figures. But we also need to remember that COVID cases, as by the ministry's data itself, only 2.3% of the cases have needed oxygen. And only 1.6% needed ICU care and 0.28% need ventilators. That's about 4 or 5% of the cases needing specialist hospital care. So even the 95% COVID cases need, it's not that they don't need care. They need home care where there is good care taken of them and of their uh, health status, monitoring of the health status to see and check that they don't become serious and to refer them to hospitals in time and to get them there on time. Right? Now, all of that requires good primary level care and public services are the ones which will provide this. This is what requires the right care at the right time and the right place and the patients getting there. But the focus that we have had in the preparatory period, especially in March and April, has been on ramping up the infrastructure and the technology. So infrastructure in terms of converting existing hospitals into COVID hospitals, thereby preventing patients of other illnesses getting the care that they needed, which, as I just pointed out, is about 99% of the entire causes of death that happen, uh, that are likely to happen in this whole year. Um, and the one real lacuna of our public system, which is the human resources, the large vacancies we have in our public system of doctors and nurses and so on is where the bottleneck lay and that was not addressed. Except maybe, you know, states like Kerala, which did recruit in more doctors or later in Maharashtra and Bombay, especially where they tried to get in doctors from other states. But other than that, by and large, we've not dealt with the human resources issue. And even today, I don't hear attention being given to that issue adequately. So the COVID patients even with mild symptoms, end up going to the private sector and the private sector has a heyday. Two things, in fact, if you see in the last few, several months where 
private sector prices have got hiked up is one the ayushman bharat scheme which provides for 5 lakhs and therefore they can hike up their rates and the second is now covid where during the pandemic we've seen that once the private sector did open up initially it closed down and then it has opened up to get the advantages of the need for health care because the others don't now have the private sector to go to and therefore they hike up their prices so the impact of covid by itself in terms of deaths is not going to be too much it's going to be much more in terms of decreasing the access to health care for other problems and thereby increase health impact ma'am just to follow up on you with what you said about the infrastructure and the emphasis that needs to be put on it india suffers from a massive shortfall in infrastructure and unevenly distributed healthcare professionals the density of physicians is 0.7 to 1000 citizens and that of nurses is 1.7 to 1000 citizens and most of this is concentrated in urban india is india equipped to handle the pandemic see our public system infrastructure is inadequate yet it's largely there and that has what has helped us in the pandemic so we need to recognize its worth and the fact that it has delivered in fact not only now when we saw for example the national rural health mission the ramping up of infrastructure and bringing in of more hr certainly helped in decreasing the out of pocket expenditure of people across the country so you had you know a, a large shift almost a doubling of public expenditure over patient expenditure from 17 to 30% so um, you know there is a lot to say for our public system and yet the weaknesses and gaps are there and the gaps very clearly to my mind are in terms of human resources as you said we, we count it's about 0.7 per 1000 population of doctors but then we are counting only mbbs doctors and the registered mbbs doctors we have a somewhat smaller number of ayush doctors and they the two together form almost 1.7 per 1000 and that's very close to the who standard for 2 per 1000 therefore we have this we also have nurses we also have anms we have the paramedics all of which together can be put to the task as we build up our human resources as well so the problem to me at the moment seems to be the deployment of human resources we are not getting them in the right place at the right time and that seems to be a big problem so you know you just take the fact that we have over 80% and more of our doctors in the private sector and the public sector has failed to attract them not because they don't want to join there are umpteen studies which show that doctors are not averse to joining the public system but they must get regular employment what we are doing now is giving them contractual work whether it's doctors or nurses and that's then not attractive enough they must get conditions to work where what they have been taught can be applied well and therefore ramping up the kind of infrastructure and facilities required so it becomes a part of a chicken egg, egg problem where you have to have hr to have good services and you have to have good services to attract the hr but that's where the government must put its act together and ensure that you know rational recruitment policies conditions of work etc are put in place and that is the gap we seem to experience you know whether it is you look at dentists 3% of dentists are in government service 97% are outside even among the nurses that we have only about the lady health visitors and anms who are trained basically to do rural health services only one third of the registered nhvs and anms are in rural areas in government service the rest of them seem to be working outside government service and in urban areas therefore this shift is what we really seem to require in addition to increasing the numbers nurse practitioners is another area that needs to be addressed to fill these gaps but we need to really focus on the primary level services as much as we do hospitals the pandemic the whole focus has been on hospitals much more than on the primary level and it's the primary level that kerala showed us was able to actually contain the pandemic while we are discussing healthcare professionals abhay sir 
Jan Swastha Abhiyan has a pan India presence, and you work very closely with movements and the people. Even though many leaders have mocked India's public health infrastructure created since independence. most state governments have relied almost exclusively on india's public health infra- infrastructure beat aims asha workers doctors nurses paramedics and allied healthcare staff during this pandemic has private healthcare done enough okay so yeah this is of course a, a very important question and uh, we need to understand that in the health system in india there are two different logics which are kind of contending with each other so one logic is the profit logic which essentially says that healthcare is a commodity to be sold in the market and uh, people should be allowed to make profit out of healthcare and uh, you know basically those who have the money will buy healthcare those who do not have the money will you know they can just fend for themselves and uh, basically it's a it's a market uh, a free market scenario now this profit logic is of course very very problematic when it comes to healthcare which i will come to in a minute but against this profit logic there is another logic which is the social logic and the social logic holds that health and healthcare are basic human rights and every human being irrespective of their background uh, must have the right to healthcare and therefore publicly organized systems must deliver this healthcare to everyone uh because it's only public systems which can do that so in india today it is the profit logic which has been dominant this is the reality and that is why when the covid epidemic hit uh it was such a big shock because um while roughly 70% of healthcare utilization is in the private sector as ritu has mentioned more than 80% of doctors are in the private sector but this sector was not geared to fulfill social needs in an epidemic so we saw private clinics getting shut down private hospitals refusing to admit a large number of patients or some of them admitting patients but indulging in gross overcharging and profiteering uh, so like one we have a case of one covid patient who had to pay 29 lakh rupees in a private hospital a corporate hospital in gurgaon just for you know a treatment of covid and many many other such cases so because of you know this entire situation because the private sector was not at all willing to take up the social responsibility the whole load of treating covid patients primarily fell on the public health system which as you know has been underfunded understaffed underdeveloped in the last several decades so obviously um despite this more than 80% of covid patients uh have been treated by public hospitals uh this is a reality and uh, so in this entire situation but they obviously have been heavily overstretched because of their historical underfunding and uh, and historical weaknesses so in this situation the private sector uh, because it did not do what it was supposed to do therefore some state governments were forced to step in and uh, at least as a temporary measure bring in private healthcare providers in some form uh to make them conform to the social logic at least on a temporary basis in maharashtra in tamil nadu uh, uh, in uh, states like even kerala and uh, even delhi uh, rates for covid care at least in a proportion of beds have been capped uh, which is a positive step but it's not enough uh, but it showed that you know something which had been resisted by the private healthcare sector since at least the last few decades <laughs> was done overnight almost once it became clear that you know people are dying and uh, you know the political will which was absent it suddenly materialized out of thin air <laughs> and governments did what they should have done a few decades back actually so uh, th- so we saw this happening we also saw that many governments realized that you know this uh, pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana which i'll be maybe talking about a little more um was a very inadequate vehicle to engage private providers because this is optional and contractual so you know some hospitals may join many hospitals may not join even those hospitals which have joined they may or may not admit patients that's not how you, how you can treat an emergency so state government stepped in and actually took over private hospitals in several states because they knew that their own scheme was a flop <laughs> they couldn't rely on pmgy to really mount the kind 
response that was required to treat all COVID patients who were, you know, pouring in. So, uh, again, a lesson for us. So, two big lessons here. A, rate regulation of the private healthcare sector, a long overdue demand of the health movement is now back on the agenda. And it is something which is doable, provided there is political will. Half a dozen state governments have done it overnight. It needs to be done on a continued basis and across the country. The overcharging is not limited only to COVID. Overcharging, gross overcharging, exploitative overcharging by the private healthcare sector has been a feature which many of us are aware of. And this must be uh, controlled uh, on a permanent basis. And the second big lesson is that the whole PMJY scheme, I think when it was really required, and state governments had to look for alternatives in whatever way, maybe in a, a patchy way, maybe on a temporary basis, but it should, it has opened a window for us to think about alternative ways of the public health system engaging private providers in a way which should be much more accountable and effective than PMJY. So you're talking about a PMJY scheme. Roughly 9 out of 10 Indians are self-employed, which means that they're not covered by any employer-provided health insurance scheme. Even if they get coverage from Ayushman Bharat, uh, it is very limited because it does cover secondary or tertiary care, but not OPD care. Can you give us an accurate assessment of how Ayushman Bharat is working and how ordinary Indians have to cope with their health care needs during this pandemic? Yeah, so see, Ayushman Bharat has two components. One is the Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroge Yojana, which probably you are mostly referring to, which is the large scheme covering about 50 crore Indians, about 10 crore households across the country, primarily for secondary and tertiary health care, hospitalization care. And the other component are the health and wellness centers, uh, which are upgraded primary health centers and sub-centers, which are supposed to provide improved and more comprehensive primary health care at the uh, grassroots level. So I think we'll talk about PMJY primarily because uh, that is the uh, kind of component which has been more uh, responsible for or effect is supposed to be providing care during the COVID epidemic to critical patients. Now, uh, the data in end of May this year showed that out of about uh, 1.8 lakh COVID patients at that time, only about 2,100 had been given hospitalization care under PMJY. So, you know, that gives you some idea that, uh, you know, of course, not all of them required hospitalization, but probably less than uh, only around, uh, you know, uh, one or two percent of the patients who required hospitalization care were getting it through PMJY. A recent study, which is, uh, I mean, uh, data from the PMJY program itself, which has been published in Hindu, shows us that there has been a drop of 50% in utilization of PMJY uh, in the post-COVID period. Of course, the lockdown has been also responsible for that, but another big factor is that this is optional. So the PMJY hospitals are fair weather friends. <laughs> you see, it is said that it's in a crisis that you come to know who are your real friends and who are your fair weather friends. So PMJY are hosp private hospitals are fair weather friends. So when the going is good, when there are profits to be made, when, you know, you can perform some minor procedure and get a good amount of money from the government, they're interested. When it comes to dealing with an emergency, when it comes to really saying, okay, may not make some profits for some period of time, but we need to serve people who are dying, then they opt out. So PMJY has been a flop in the COVID context. I mean, pardon me for using a strong word, but it has not lived up to its uh, promise. It has not lived up to its hype. And which means, as I said earlier, that we need alternative modes of engaging private healthcare providers in a publicly organized system, which will be far more effective and which will take us in the direction of universal healthcare. So there are these three big changes that we need in the way that the public health system will deal with private providers. Besides, of course, comprehensive regulation, including regulation of rates, uh, there are three more steps which need to be taken. A, the scheme has to be universal. Across the world, we know that targeted schemes are uh, not very effective. Schemes for the poor become poor schemes. So if you only say 40% of the people are going to get care, 60% of the people, the majority of the population is left out, then all kinds of distortions come in. And the most vulnerable, the weakest, the people with least voice, the least literate, they are the ones who have to struggle 
with a <laughs> you know uh, a system which is uh, kind of gamed in different ways by the private providers so number one it has to be universal number two it cannot be optional you see you cannot say that optional is fair weather friends so you say okay those private providers which want to come in you can come in if you don't want to come in you can stay out so all the big bridge candies and medantas and <clears throat> maxes will stay out and some of the smaller providers or medium sized hospitals you know whose beds are empty you know they'll kind of reluctantly come in and uh, you know they'll keep grumbling about the rates and it doesn't work that way so we have to say okay 50% of all beds in all private hospitals will be brought under the public scheme and this will be increased over time let's start with 50% so that becomes something substantial obligatory and where people can walk into a hospital and say half of the beds in this hospital are for me as a free patient no confusion so right now it's not even clear in the pmj hospital how which beds are reserved for those patients so a patient goes in this is nahi aapke liye to bed nahi hai sorry So that's the end of the story. So that, that nonsense will not be allowed. So there has to be a dashboard which shows 50% of the beds are reserved and how many of those are filled, filled and you know how many are vacant. So number two, it has to be obligatory, and number three, it has to be uh, on, on a sound rights-based kind of framework uh, where this care is entirely free. There are no exclusions. It is all inclusive. You cannot say आप भी दवाई बाहर से खरीद लो टेस्ट बाहर से करवा लो इसमें तो आपका इतना ही कवरेज होता है ऑल दिस नॉन सेंस शुड नॉट बी देर इट्स हंड्रेड परसेंट फ्री केयर विच हैज टू बी गिवन इन अ स्ट्रॉग राइट बेस्ड फ्रेमवर्क एंड विद अ स्ट्रॉग रिवर्स रिजर्सल मैकेनिज्म विच इज पेशेंट फ्रेंडली विच इज पीपल फ्रेंडली एंड विच इज वेरी वाइडली पब्लिसाइज एंड 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 ऑपरेशनलाइज सो इफ दीज आर डन देन यू नो दिस बिग एलिफेंट of private health care ye jo bada haathi hai jo abhi tak nirankush tha uske upar ankush laya ja sakta hai aur ankush lane ki zarurat hai then profit logic will get controlled social logic will get strengthened and instead of the current situation where profit logic is dominant and social logic is in a back seat social logic will dominate the entire health system and profit logic will be controlled and that is the direction we need to move towards to achieve universal health care and the right to health care right sir i want to ask my panelists a common question article 47 of india's constitution stipulates that it is the duty of the state to raise living standards and improve public health given this has become extremely crucial now what would you do differently and what ideas would you immediately implement so right. start with Hmm. Okay. Um, I think two uh, the two dimensions and the two approaches to health that uh, Doctor Abey has talked about the profit motive and the social motive. That is one way in which the two approaches are clearly different. I want to also point to another one which the pandemic has brought to the fore very clearly. There it can be a democratic health care and there can be a very authoritarian kind of health care. and we saw in the pandemic the way the lockdown was put on the as if the taking care of people's health was a law and order issue and thereby legitimizes the use of state force to bring benefit to pay, to people because you think it is of benefit for them right this kind of a logic is becoming very much part of our governance structure today and it is getting more and more legitimacy therefore also in people's minds because of the fear of ill health and of covid and the deaths that can come with it and so on now this therefore will allow also enhancement and use and possible misuse of something like a digital health mission the violation of people's privacy all of these during a pandemic seem very logical because it has to be controlled but then they start becoming the new normal and that's where when you asked your earlier question also what is going to be the impact of covid this kind of a further shift towards an authoritarian governance overall and in healthcare is likely in the post pandemic scenario and the consequence of that when we see for healthcare and i'll confine myself to that largely is for example that we have a universal lockdown instead of what should have happened is 
an early quarantine for all international travelers, which is much easier because they are located in airports coming out of there and you locate them and restrict their movement and calibrated lockdowns wherever it emerges. Instead of that, we have something which is so drastic and it's not, not been done in any other country in the world. And what it does to our economy, we are all aware of. We are seeing the consequences, including, of course, the migrant workers and so on. But as much the middle class and working class is getting affected and very worried about even their own incomes and livelihoods in the coming months. So how do we see this is a public health issue? It's an issue because it affects people's quality of life, standard of living. As you rightly pointed out, the Constitution makes giving people a sta better standard of living a constitutional responsibility. But this certainly withdrew from that. And thereby, now for health, from a public health angle, our greatest concerns, therefore, are livelihood and food. One can envisage something like a hidden famine. Because you'll have people in rural areas who have gone back, have no work, and will be sitting in their homes with no food at all. The PDS system works for those with ration cards. The NREGS is limited. And therefore, where will all that happen is one big concern for public health. For the pu public health sector, like I was pointing out in Kerala, as well as Dharavi shows us clearly, the primary sector is something, the primary level care services are extremely critical to be able to contain something like a pandemic. And of course, they're critical to see us through uh, all the major health problems that India suffers from, whether it is malnutrition, maternal and child health, tuberculosis, and so on and so forth. So building that up, what the pandemic also showed us is the lack of use or the lack of any understanding of public health and its relevance. That the decision making is done not with your own public health experts, but with some statistical modeling that has been done internationally. And therefore, you have this kind of a drastic lockdown and its consequences and so on. So uh, building the primary level services, building public health systems and a public health cadre that will see us through using our human resources to the best possible, using the resources that we may put to it. And of course, we need to increase the resources as well. So uh, the pandemic is bringing up these issues more and more clearly to us. Workers' health is something that, because of the whole attention on migrants, things should now deserve much more attention than it has before. And we are seeing more suicides, more domestic violence. All of these areas need much more attention. So we have a comprehensive public health in the post-COVID period. So would you like to add? Yeah. You talked about Article 7, 47 of the Directive Principles, and that is correct. That is our starting point. But 74 years after independence, now we need to convert what was a broad principle in the Constitution into a fundamental right. And that is the right to health care should become a fundamental right in the Constitution. This is a demand of the People's Health Movement of Jal Swastavyan. Just yesterday, we had a a national session of the People's Parliament, which is a session on health, and where the, this was the primary resolution which emerged, that the right to health care should be a fundamental right. So this is very clear. It's unambiguous. And, um, you know, if we claim to be a global superpower, we claim to be a, a, <laughs> a country which is, you know, uh, claiming to occupy a stage, you know, at the global level, uh, it's, it's high time that, you know, at least basic health care uh, becomes a, a right of everybody. And linked with that, uh, a right to health care acts in every state of this country because health is a health services are a state subject. So, you know, state governments need to be centrally involved, but both the state government and the central governments, uh, central government need to be, uh, you know, uh, come together and uh, operationalize right to health care. So this is number one. And this will drive the entire health system into a higher level of functionality. This is very important. No? So it's not just because, because people need their rights. It's also because the health system needs to be pushed into becoming uniformly and consistently and adequately functional. And we have seen this happen. That when people start demanding their health rights, 
the public health system which was earlier kind of dysfunctional non functional close down health facilities absent staff all kinds of things they suddenly you know get turned up and they start functioning in a much more effective way <clears throat> so the right to health care is important to uh, bring the entire health system up to a, a adequate level of functionality uh, this is uh, one important step that we need to take the second which uh, ritu has pointed uh, towards very correctly and i will add to that is democratizing the health system you know <laughs> so we are supposed to be a democracy it's a kind of a low intensity democracy which is in which the intensity is low getting even lower now <laughs> as you know so <laughs> in this situation instead of lowering the intensity of democracy we need to have full fledged democracy in every sector including the health system so of course it's not going to happen in isolation in the health sector but definitely on this front we are talking right now democratizing the health system means that we are currently all decision making is completely centralized and in the covid period has become hyper centralized i can tell you you know even mlas and mps are complaining to us that you know we have no role we have nothing to say we are not being consulted there's a very small click of officials and some top most political bosses they are taking all the decisions and nobody else is involved so let alone civil society organizations social movements women's groups citizens organizations ordinary people in sabko to chhod hi dijiye even the yesterday we had three mps on our in the session and they all three said that even the parliament is not being consulted <laughs> so hyper centralization of power is the opposite of democracy and de- democratization of the health system means first and foremost decentralization which the kerala health minister talked about yesterday in our session and along with decentralization also greater empowerment of ordinary people and their various kinds of organizations at the grassroots level to be involved in both monitoring and planning health services and this is very important because uh, to whatever extent you know we have seen a better performance of the health system in kerala one important factor has been that their panchayats are genuinely empowered they receive 40% of the total funding for most departments and uh, you know they uh, are able to take decisions at the local level in consultation with people or at least broadly in keeping with people's requirements rather than everything being dictated from the state capital or the national capital so this decentralization of power related to health services is also very important and that is why we have the demand that there should be health councils highly participatory and multi sectoral health councils in every district every city and also at the state level where different diverse sections of people including elected representatives it should be uh, complementary to our uh, you know elected democracy but as we know that uh, only leaving uh, democracy to the elected representatives is also not a great idea so <laughs> you know in maharashtra we have a saying that instead of lok shahi we have lok pratinidhi shahi which means that you know instead of <laughs> you get the meaning i suppose so the point is that these kind of health councils should be formed at all district and state levels and then complementing this from the bottom up from the village from the urban ward level to the block level uh, and to the you know city level and the district level there is need for community based monitoring and planning committees and processes which will regularly uh, bring people's voices into the health system in a very powerful and effective way so that local health officials providers they need to function in close consultation with people in uh, keeping with the people's aspirations which may be quite diverse in different places especially marginalized groups of people whose voices are not usually held, held heard in the health system they all need to be heard they need to be addressed and decision making including planning also needs to be democratized which is currently highly uh, centralized and you know it's almost autocratic public health actually systems have been traditionally very autocratic and you know centralized in nature and you've seen this in the covid epidemic so you know suddenly we <laughs> hear that a lockdown is being imposed at a 4 hour notice or something like this and you know millions of people are stranded completely left out in the cold facing huge hardships and you know nobody is answerable nobody is accountable so the public health system and in fact in fact the entire health system has to be democratized in a very systematic way through very participatory mechanisms not just as a vague aspiration but as a very very concrete um, you know uh, process and uh, without that actually the right to healthcare will also not mean very much 
So because people need to be in, in control, they need to be in command. We're calling it a democracy, ruled by the people. So what does ruled by the people mean? <laughs> ruled by the people means, if you take it seriously, that people will decide. People will have their opinions. And of course, it will not be this. People are not a monolith. So all different sections, castes, religions, genders, and so on, <clears throat> all, with all their diversity, people will be actively involved. And they will have a deciding voice uh, in, uh, you know, uh, de determining how the health system functions and how it's planned. And uh, Brazil has health councils. Brazil has more than 5,000 uh, health councils at the municipality level, which is like our taluka, roughly, a similar level. And uh, then across all the 24 provinces, they have, you know, state health councils, and then they have a national health council. And I've met some of their representatives when I visited Brazil, and it was really tre tremendously, you know, inspiring to see how these kind of bodies function. They all planning, health planning is done by these health councils in which 50% of the representatives are from civil society. 25% are officials and 25% are healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and so on. So, you know, we need to, of course, adapt that in the Indian situation. It should be synergized with the elected democracy. Elected representatives have an important role to play, but we will need to democratize health services and community-based monitoring and planning of which we have a significant positive example in Maharashtra as part of the National Health Mission. We have shown that if people are given a space to participate, people do actively participate and health services significantly improve as a result of this democratization. So democracy is good for public health to conclude with. And uh, the lack of democracy <laughs> by the same token is very bad for public health. So if you want public health, not only during epidemics, but even beyond epidemics, we really have to have full, uh, you know, wide ranging, full fledged and very active democrat democratization of health services and for that matter, all other aspects of, you know, public life and uh, public systems uh, in this country linked with a strong rights based framework. That is the way forward. And uh, those political forces, those social forces uh, which are in favor of this need to come together. They need to become much more visible, much more active and need to reach out to much, much wider range of, uh, range of people. And those forces which will be opposed to this, they will ultimately land up in the dustbin of history. That is what the history of the last uh, at least couple of century tells us, including, the, you know, in the 19, you know, 1920s and 1930s. We have seen autocratic forces coming to power and then uh, being swept into the dustbin of history because they completely, you know, failed people on all fronts. So, yeah, we, we need this kind of yeah, democratization and a rights based framework uh, linked with strong public health services, regulated private health care sector and much more active role of uh, ordinary people at all levels. Uh, that should be the way forward. Clearly, India has a long way to go, even though a vaccine uh, seems to be on the horizon. It seems unlikely that we will be able to be a swast Bharat if things stay as they are. Something needs to be done urgently. If we don't, then the pandemic is not just going to have far-reaching implications on health, but also on poverty, which is going to increase dramatically if Indians keep having to spend out of their pocket for healthcare. This is going to have an impact on our economy, our society, and our politics. The gains that we've made in the last 70 years will all be undone. Thank you for joining us today.